King. I'm the uh, Senior Public Safety Advisor for Mayor Wheeler. If we, if we could ask everybody to have a seat, and we'll begin. It'll take a minute for everybody to make their way to, the, to a place to sit down. I want to begin by uh, welcoming uh, Pastor, Pastor Matt, to the stage. Uh, he's graciously hosted this evening's event, and we just wanted to give him a chance to say a few words. Pastor? Well, welcome to Central. It's a pleasure to, to host this conversation tonight and to be a part of the, just of the community. Over the last several years, we have been trying really hard to be intentional in how we engage our community, how we love our neighbors. A part of the community, I believe that, that God has created us for relationship and for community, and so we are here to help build and foster that kind of community, a good and loving and caring community. And so I'm just thrilled to have you all here tonight so that we can just have that conversation, talk about what having a loving and safe community might look like, and what are some steps that we can take to get there, and, and how we can all be a part of that. So I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being here, and welcome. We're the Hearst Neighborhood Association with folks, Sabina, who helped organize tonight's event. Sabina, are you here? Can you come up? I'd love for you to say a word. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, I wanted to start by reading a land acknowledgement. Uh, we want to respectfully acknowledge that the land that we are on are the traditional homes to the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kaklamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes. We are grateful for their stewardship and relationship with the land, water, and wildlife long before we arrived here as guests. And I also wanted to thank all the bureaus and agencies and folks who showed up on very short notice tonight. Uh, Portland Water Bureau, thank you Anna and Corbett, the Oregon Department of Transportation, thank you to Tiana, Civic Life, thank you for bringing your team, Stacy, Daniel, Steve, Cassandra, and Mary, the Office of Youth Violence Prevention, Tom, Bureau of Emergency Communications, Bob and Chelsea, um, the Winter Bike Skillshare, Mike, uh, Bureau of Emergency Management, Devon, uh, thank you to also our um, Public Safety Chair, Robert Schultz. Uh, I want to thank all the volunteers who are here to make this possible, uh, the seen and unseen ones, all the ones that are holding it down for us at home so that the rest of us can be here, um, and everyone else who showed up just because they care about their community. I think it's important to recognize the power dynamic of uh, some of the people who joined us tonight who get paid to do this, whereas the rest of us who have come um, simply because we care. Um, the Neighborhood Association's motivation for being a part of this event was to try to raise awareness about all the aspects of public or community safety, not just crime, and to bring all these other bureaus and organizations to the table and have a larger conversation and a holistic, coordinated approach about what it means to keep everyone safe in our community. We want to recognize that when we talk about community safety, we should talk about the safety of house people, but also unhoused people. Homeowners, renters, people living on the street or in their cars, people who have a physical address or no address at all, people who have IDs, don't have IDs, people who maybe don't speak English, uh, people of all ages, including the youth, and vulnerable people, and people of color who often don't feel safe around the police. Everyone's safety matters tonight and every night at Lens. And hopefully, now that all of us here are in the same room together, we will um, have a better idea of who to call next time we need help, whether it's someone from the city or maybe one of your neighbors. Thank you for being here. I want to do a quick review of the ground rules for everybody. So the plan this evening is obviously we have panelists here tonight with us, and then we're going to have them introduce themselves here in just a moment. But part of it is going to be them presenting you with some information from uh, the different positions that they hold, the different roles that they have in the city and in the bureau. And, um, and then we're going to have question and answer. And Pastor Matt and I will have microphones, and we're going to be out um, gathering the questions from you. So just a quick note on ground rules. Um, 
Take space, make space. Be aware of how much or how little you speak. If you're speaking more than other, others, make space for others to share. If you're not speaking much, encourage yourself to share. Uh, it's okay to disagree. Challenge ideas, but not people personally. Tonight is not, events like this are not a debate. We're here to provide you with information, but we're also here to have a conversation because we want to hear directly from you what your thoughts are, what your concerns are, and how we can collaborate and work better together. Uh, one speaker at a time, as I said, the pastor and I will have the microphones and we'll make our way out to everybody in the audience so that everybody that's here tonight will have an opportunity to ask a question or make a point. Uh, no name calling, stereotyping, or making assumptions about other people. Um, talk about everyone with respect and dignity. Respect each other. It says on here, especially your facilitator. <laughs> so I don't know why that's on there, but anyway. Uh, facilitators and uh, but active um, engage in active listening you know be here tonight and just really hear what it is that's being said we're coming tonight with information solutions a resource you have your city and county representatives here tonight who serve you and who want to be helpful and want to be responsive to you um, in your neighborhoods around the concerns that you have about your home your family your business um, tonight just we ask that you uh, Offer solutions. If you're, if you're, what does success look like? Offer it through that perspective and through that lens. There's a lot about the conversation we're going to have tonight that can be frustrating, but you have people that are here that are doing the job every day on your behalf, and we want to know how we can better serve you. And that comes with you helping us by offering some solutions. We'll have solutions we're going to share with you, but we'd like to hear them from you as well. Uh, stick to the topic on the table. The topic is a broad one. It's really crime, safety, livability for East Portland, Lentz in particular. Um, and we all here tonight share responsibility for making this uh, work. And with that, I'd like to start by doing an introduction of everybody that's on the stage. Art Nakamura, I'm commander of the Tactical Operations Division, and one of the units I oversee is the gun violence response. <coughs> My name is Jeremy Price, I'm a lieutenant at East Precinct Day Shift, and I'm uh, the acting commander currently at East Precinct. Ted Wheeler, Mayor of City of Portland. Good evening, I'm Danielle Alwal, Chief of Police. Good evening, Jeff Bell, and I work for the Portland Police Bureau, and I'm the commander of the Detective Division. Hello, I'm Tom Pigby, I'm the interim director for the Mayor's Office of the Finance Division. Thank you all for that. I also want to welcome Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, who's here. In the audience. Thank you very much for coming to the And I just would like everybody who's here just to, just to take a look around and what you'll see is tonight you've got representatives from all across the city, from fire, from police, from water, from Department of Transportation, from Civic Life. Um, Jonathan Lewis is in the back from One Point of Contact. Bob Causey and his team are here from 911. Um, Bike Share and other folks are here. All, Mike from PBAM is here. Mike Meyer, the director of PBAM. City Resources are here tonight to be in support of you and, in, and your families. And so with that, um, I am going to turn it over uh, at this time to our mayor, Mayor Ted Wheeler. Well, first of all, let me say thank you very much for having us here. Pastor Matt, thank you for sharing your parish facility with all of us tonight. Sabina, thank you for having the suggestion that we come and address some very specific issues. Uh, first of all, obviously, as you can tell by the crowd in the room, uh, there's a lot of people here who are here to express a lot of concerns. There's also a lot of people from the city of Portland and other jurisdictions that are interested in helping to address those concerns. I've said it before, I'll say it again tonight, that East Portland is the heart and the center of the city. And this is not my first time, obviously, in Lentz. I've, I've been here several times. The most memorable time that I came to Lentz was actually right after I took office. And I came here, I heard your concerns, and I believe there's been a significant amount of work that's been done since that time that I first heard your concerns as mayor, and there's work yet to be done. And the many representatives of many bureaus here tonight are helped to here to talk a little bit about what has been done and also where we think we need more partnership, where we need to frankly do a better job and we want to hear what you have to say as well. Uh, first of all, let me just state an obvious value. Everybody in this community, everybody, deserves to feel safe and to be safe. 
And collectively, it's our job in local government to make sure that that happens. It's also our job to make sure that you have a clean community, a livable community, as well as a safe and prosperous community. And those are our broad objectives. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of representatives. Uh, uh, we've already heard from Robert. Uh, we've already heard from some other folks about the representatives here. As you heard, we have people from East Precinct, the Detective Division, uh, GDRT, the Gun Violence Reduction Team, the Office of Youth Violence Prevention, all here tonight. And we also, because I assume that this conversation, based on some of my preliminary conversations with some of you here, is going to expand into some other livability issues. We also have people from the One Point of Contact here. They deal with issues related to homelessness and homeless camps. We also have some people here who do livability work. Um, one contextual point that I want to make is that um, we're all, as people who live in this city, concerned about some of the things that we've seen going on. This summer, we had some gun violence. We had some homicides here in the Lens community. I heard from many of you. I heard expressions of severe concern and anxiety, and those fears are completely justified. We want to talk about those and address those issues here today. In terms of some of the work that's been done, uh, obviously in the last budget process, we continue to strengthen and support the gun violence reduction team. I'll let them speak for themselves about the work they've been doing. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about police officers and whether or not we have adequate policing presence in our communities. I fought hard during the last budget process uh, in 2017 to actually increase the number of officers on the street. I secured funding from my colleagues on the city council uh, we are in the process of uh, recruiting new officers. We have people who are already going through the training process, and it continues to be a top priority for me to make sure that we have adequate police presence in our community. We also uh, worked very hard uh, to clean up ODOT properties. We worked hard with our state partners in ODOT. We uh, got some legislation passed during the last law and legislation that allowed us to enter into a memorandum of understanding with ODOT so that the city and ODOT could work on maintaining and keeping those right of ways clean and accessible. And uh, I continue to be a strong proponent of addressing the homelessness crisis. Now, some of you may want to talk about that. In a nutshell, uh, when I took office, we were cleaning, I think it was about 44 campsites per week. Those were campsites that were identified as being specifically public safety, public health, or environmental hazards. I believe in the last quarter we cleaned something like 800 of those camps that were prioritized as public health, public safety, or environmental hazards. So we've obviously increased that function. Uh, we do it in a compassionate way. And we do it in a way where we send out social service providers first to try and get people off the streets and out of the elements and into housing and connect them with whatever services they need. And for some, it's mental health services, others it's addiction treatment, others it's job services, uh, whatever it takes to help get people off the street. We've increased the number of shelters. We've opened three new ones. We just opened two new navigation centers, which connect people to services, again, with the purpose of getting them off the street and helping keep them off the street. We worked very hard to create navigation teams that go out into the community. So if people don't want to come to a shelter, we go to them. We go where they are in the community and work with them to build trust and with the end goal being of connecting people to the services they need to get off and stay off the streets. Last year, about 7,500 families received some form of homeless prevention services, so think rent support and the like, to keep those who are the most likely to go into homeless off the streets. And we moved about 6,000 people either off the streets or out of shelter into housing. And those are just some of the things we're doing. I'm working with Commissioner Hardesty on a new approach to addressing crises on our streets. I think we can all acknowledge that we have an addiction issue in this community. I think we can all acknowledge that there is a mental health situation in this community that, are, you know, that aren't being addressed as effectively as they could. Uh, and too often, it's the police who are asked to respond to people in crisis. 
They don't believe they are necessarily the best people in all circumstances to address people in crisis. And those who are advocates and supporters of those on the streets who are in crisis don't necessarily think a police officer is necessarily the right person to be that first responder. So Commissioner Hardesty and I and others are working on something called the Portland Street Response, which will connect those in crisis on the streets with mental health providers or other social service providers who are specifically trained in crisis management and the police would only be there if it is truly a public safety related situation. Um, the advantage of not having the police be there all the time is we need the police to do other things. As I've said, I think we have a shortage of police presence in this community and I'd like to see them out there doing the frontline public safety policing work for which they are trained and for which they are the best equipped to be able to address. Uh, finally, I, I want to just mention addiction services. The city typically doesn't get involved in things like addiction services and mental health, uh, but I've decided I'm going to take that upon myself, and my colleagues on the city council have decided to take a higher profile around addiction services and mental health issues because we're seeing more of it on our streets. And I was very proud, Joanne and, and others, that the city council this year agreed to put funding into addiction treatment services directly. That was a first for the city of Portland, and you are going to see me talking more about the need for on-demand addiction treatment in our community, and you're going to hear more from me about the need for us to work with our county and our state partners to fix the mental health delivery system in this state. For too long, we have been near the bottom of states in terms of access to mental health services. We're the fourth in terms of addiction nationally, which means Oregon has very high rates of addiction, but we're about 47th to 50th, depending upon which score you look at in terms of actual access to addiction treatment in our community. And that's certainly exacerbating some of the issues we see on the street. I, as mayor, cannot just push that off and say it's the county's responsibility or the state's responsibility or anybody else's responsibility. If we're going to solve these problems, that it is incumbent upon me and my colleagues to reach out and provide the leadership that needs to be provided in those two areas. Uh, last but not least, I just want to say this. I made a commitment to you when I came here as a newly elected mayor. And I told you that it was important to me and that I would not see myself as successful in this role as mayor until the people in this community felt safe until the people in this community felt like their neighborhoods and their community was livable and that they would not feel satisfied until their community lived up to the reputation that it has as being a livable and clean and prosperous community. It's a work in progress. We're not there yet. If we were, nobody would be here tonight. But I want to re-up the commitment I made to you then and tell you that I approach this commitment with more optimism and more energy than I ever have. I'm here to hear you. I appreciate your being here tonight, and I thank you for the opportunity to serve as your mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And for Chief Outlaw, if Chief Outlaw, do you want to go next? Are we standing up or we I've just been standing up. If you don't mind, I, I'm going to be brief because I really do want to reserve the majority of the time to allow us to hear from you. Um, one, I, I want to re-emphasize um, appreciation for you all being here tonight. Yes, this is our jobs, but you guys came here on your own time. In the evening, and I'm quite sure it's been a long day, it's been tiring, uh, but you're here because you care. And to be curious means that you care. It's clear that you're curious about what's going on in your communities. And without your care and concern, which ultimately holds us accountable, we don't have the partnerships that we need with our local communities in order to move any strategy ahead. So again, I want to say thank you. I want to acknowledge not just that we have leadership here, up here on, this, on the stage or the dais, but if you look around, um, all of the people that are aligned up 
on these back walls are the people that are actually doing the work that we're talking about. And I think it's important for all of us to be in this room to hear directly from you without the filters from us what needs to take place, what the genuine concerns are, um, and, and how it makes you feel. Because with that face-to-face -face interaction and hearing from you directly, it not only motivates us to continue forward, but it reminds us that there are human beings at the other end being impacted by what we're talking about tonight. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I also want to thank um, our PPB personnel and all of the other city staff for being here as well, because this shows a true effort in working towards a comprehensive strategy towards resolving the issues we're talking about and making sure that community safety is our priority. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Now we turn it over to Lieutenant Kirby Parks from East Precinct for an East Precinct update. All right, good uh, evening, everybody. Um, so I just wrote down a few things that we've been doing in the precinct to try to help address or reduce crime uh, in East Precinct. And I want to start off by just kind of explaining the boundaries of what we have. Uh, East Precinct is uh, 36 square miles. Uh, population is approximately 225,000. And uh, we have 124 dedicated officers uh, to service all the calls for service in that area. Uh, and I'll tell you, I started my career at East Precinct 18 years ago, and it's great to be back. And uh, the commander and captain that we have at the precinct uh, are fully involved in trying to uh, reduce crime and be uh, present for uh, the, the community that we serve. Uh, some of the things that we've been doing, uh, Quarter three, our objective was to focus on retail theft and the crimes associated with that. Um, and, and we try to do that without limiting our response times for calls for service, so we use our officers that are our neighborhood response team and our street crimes unit. Uh, some of the things that we did in the last quarter, uh, we made 230 arrests related to um, areas of like uh, Eastport Plaza, the Walmart area, uh, Mall 205, uh, the Home Depot there, and the Gateway Plaza. Uh, and then uh, kind of what spun off from that is obviously things that people are stealing items for is to trade for drugs and things like that. Um, we've re recovered 15 pounds of uh, narcotics, that being methamphetamine and heroin. Along with that, um, we recovered 15 firearms, uh, mostly related to those uh, drug arrests. Uh, we actually just re recovered another uh, seven firearms this morning uh, from a search warrant that we did. Uh, and then we seized uh, over $30,000 uh, uh, yeah, related to those drug offenses. Uh, going forward into quarter four, uh, and I think we're, there'll be a lot of questions uh, surrounding this, uh, is the, the spike in gun violence that we've seen. Uh, East Precinct alone uh, experienced uh, a 22% increase in shots, fire calls. Doesn't necessarily mean those are all uh, uh, gun, gun violence. It could be anything from fireworks, something that somebody hears that they think is a gunshot and we respond to. Uh, and our focus is gonna be on uh, reducing those shots fired calls, uh, increasing our presence in the neighborhoods and uh, the visibility uh, that we have out there and uh, be more present in neighborhoods experiencing uh, gun violence. So that is gonna be our focus going into quarter four. Uh, and uh, like I said, we have uh, some of the most dedicated officers that are proud to serve East Portland. Most of them have been out here for as long as I've been with the Bureau. Uh, we have a lot of new faces, but uh, with the limited numbers that we have, we're, we're going to focus on uh, what we can in this quarter and, and continue to try to provide the best service that we possibly can. Thank you, John. So, uh, Autumn, West, is Autumn West here. Autumn uh, West's neighbor graciously reached out to us in July and shared concerns about shootings and homicides that happened in East Portland, and that was we're using a lot more data and technology to do investigations. Uh, every shell casing that's found on the street, every gun that's recovered, goes straight to our office where we process them to look for evidence. We track the guns, track the bullets. I think this year, correct me if I'm wrong, we've collected and processed over 2,000 casings on the street. That means two, over 2,000 casings or 2,000 rounds have been shot. Doesn't include revolvers and certain firearms, but were 2,000 gunshots, and that's when it was reported. A lot of times, I know for a fact, people don't call 911, they think somebody else will call. 
So I encourage you to hear gunshots, please call us. I can go on and on, but uh, respecting everybody's time. Commander, for the sake of time, yeah, as we go move to the question and answer phase, I want to give a uh, thank you very much for so, Commander. Again, we're, we're very passionate. Find us after. I love talking. Uh, just a quick word from homicide, and then we're going to move to the question and answer. Uh, so again, um, Jeff Bell, commander of the detective division, and I really appreciate being invited out here tonight. Um, one of the concerns, obviously, with gun violence is kind of the ultimate worst case scenario is homicides, and I have um, a team of very dedicated individuals that come out and investigate um, uh, a lot of a lot of homicides, a lot of suspicious deaths, um, and. Uh, I understand there were some concerns um, brought forward by some folks in the community about whether or not these homicides were being looked at. And so on a real basic <laughs> level, I just wanted to explain how the unit works. We have two sergeants and 10 detectives, and that is all they do is investigate homicides. Our homicide rate in the city is very low compared to what it used to be, um, two to three times what it is now uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s. and. Um, that is their sole purpose is to investigate these homicides. By their very nature, um, we have to be fairly careful about the information that we gather in these investigations, um, which necessarily means that we don't like to share a whole lot of it with folks until the investigation is complete. So I can completely understand the perception that maybe we're not doing anything. We, we don't close these cases. We don't suspend these cases. Um, we don't um, put them in a box somewhere where we don't look at them. Um, our homicide investigators keep these cases for the uh, entirety of their career with the police bureau and when they retire um, uh, if they had a partner on the case the partner inherits that case and when everybody retires it goes off to our cold case unit where we have detectives who are dedicated to solving and working on uh, cold case homicides so i completely understand the frustration and sometimes the lack of information um, i can say that um, one of the emails that i was forwarded mentioned several homicides. Um, they're all being worked. Uh, they're all being actively investigated. Uh, with the exception of two of the most recent ones in this area, all of the other homicides, we have enough information to be able to say that uh, none of them are linked to each other. The, the two most recent ones uh, were done by the same same person. Um, and actually, Commander Nakamura talked about our technology. We were able to link those crimes by uh, uh, determining that the casings were both fired from the same gun. That person is in custody. Um, so again, I just want to express, and I want to hear from folks if they have questions, but um, how seriously we take this, the, the taking of someone's life is kind of the, the ultimate bad criminal act. Um, and um, we take it very seriously, and we don't stop um, looking at these cases until, uh, until we've solved them. So uh, that's all I have. Commander Bell, thank you. Okay, so uh, Tom Beebe is here from the Office of Youth Violence Prevention, and in the course of the question and answer tonight, he can field questions. Uh, Pastor Matt and I are going to come out to you, and we just ask that you ask a question or make a short comment. We want to get as many people the opportunity to say something or ask a question as possible. And for panelists, don't feel like everybody has to answer the question, get an answer, and then we'll move on to the next person. So I want to as many hands up as we can, and then we want to get the mic out to you to ask some, ask some questions. Who wants to start us off tonight? I'm Frank Bell, I'm a security supervisor for Allied Universal. I'm a security supervisor for Allied Universal and represent uh, Garrity Property Management uh, here at uh, East Portland. Uh, it's more of a thought than a question, I guess. Uh, we're having a problem with trying to almost move it. Uh, everything Question. 
is there a program in place where uh, you actually have uh, someone who can verify who these suspects are once they're arrested and either detained in a temporary housing uh, uh, area until a family member or a friend can pick them up and uh, confirm their name, their address, or phone number so that we don't have this repeat situation with them. Uh, if they fail to appear in court after two or three weeks, whatever the process is here, uh, do we issue a warning for these misdemeanors? And if so, then uh, do the courts take that seriously enough so that we do something with these people, whether it's community service work, they can't return to the property, or actually have to do jail time. Thank you. Yeah, I think if, um, from what I'm hearing, uh, obviously when people are committing crimes, uh, whether they're misdemeanor or felonies, um, just like the police bureau and, and most of the other city uh, organizations, the DA's office has experienced shortages as well. That doesn't mean people shouldn't be held accountable. Uh, I, I know that when arrests are made, my officers make the arrest, they lodge people into the jail, uh, and, and it's incumbent upon the complainant to uh, make sure they follow through to prosecute. Uh, and if, if that happens, um, then the case would go in front of a judge, and they would be the deciding factor on community service and things of those natures and treatment uh, at that level. Um, are there cases that obviously don't get prosecuted? Yes. And if people don't show up to court, warrants are issued. Uh, we arrest a lot of uh, repeat offenders on warrants, uh, but unfortunately funding at the county level as well uh, for jail beds and things like that is kind of limited. Uh, so. Uh, lower status offenders are, are not going to be housed when um, when that arrest is made on the warrant and they be released to, with another court date. So uh, that may not be the answer you're looking for, uh, uh, but we can certainly. We're capturing that. and we're capturing the questions that you asked, and we're going to report back with some information on individual questions that are asked. We'll get it to Sakina so she can put it on the website. Be Lance, who's got another question for us tonight? Autumn. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, and I hope you'll indulge me if before I ask my question, I wanted to, um, we got, we have to remember that, that we're not, I don't want to just say homicide victims or gunshot victims. We're talking about human beings. And I just wanted to read this list and it, I am sorry if it's incomplete or if I pronounce people's names wrong, but Barack Rosen, Billy Mayfield, Israel Johnson, Sergey Pershko, Ke um, Keegan Thompson, Robert Lewis, James Richardson, and Cody Denny are, um, they are all homicide victims in Lentz the past two years. These are, they're, they're not just nameless victims, they're people with names and families. And um, I believe all of them are gunshot victims. Cody Denny was um, actually beaten to death. And I just want to keep the focus that you know, these are people, these are, I don't know them, but they're over my neighbors. I don't know why they were killed, but um, I just want us to remember that, you know, they're human beings. Um, my question is in particular to uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler and to Joanne Hardesky. I would love to hear from her. Um, if, you know, if you looked at the recent Portland um, survey they did, it showed a big inequity between Southeast and um, the rest of Portland, showing that crime is a bigger issue here, showing that people are less afraid to walk on the streets. You know, we, we don't enjoy, our, we're more afraid to enjoy our parks. So I think there's a big divide. And, um, one of the things that we're told, and I was also told by the DA that, that East Portland is, has the most crime of all of Oregon. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I was told. Um, so my question is, when we, when we ask these questions, I was part of the town hall two years ago, when we ask questions about, you know, why are we getting protection? How come when we call or we're put on hold and our calls aren't answered, we're continually told that, um, it's not, it's not in the budget. We're told that um, there's not enough police officers. It's not in the budget. We're under budgeted, we're understaffed. And like, and it, to me, what's more important in the budget than people's lives and safety? 
I think that, that there's a lot of things that are important in the city, but people's lives that seem to be the most important. So I want to know, moving forward from Mayor Wheeler and from Joanne Hardesky and all the council members, I want to know, are you going to make police protection for the citizens a priority in the budget? Don't tell us it's not in the budget. Make it a priority. Thank you for the question, and yes, I'm chomping at the bit to answer that question. Uh, the answer is unequivocally yes. And since the day I took office, I have fought hard to improve the situation in the Portland Police Bureau in terms of personnel, in terms of the tools that they have access to, in terms of the resources that they have, and in terms of the programming that the leadership wants. And by the way, I've also uh, brought in new leadership to help address some of these issues, including Police Chief Outlaw, who, who frankly, I think has done an outstanding job. Uh, so first of all, with regard to the budget, I make sure that there is money in the budget. And uh, as I say, the first budget that I passed, my first, you know, my own budget, which was the 2017-2018, or see, 2018-2019, fiscal year budget, I asked my colleagues for 100 new officers. And as you're aware, we have a commission form of government, which means I don't get to decide unilaterally what the budget is. I have four other people, each who have the same vote that I do. But I, I made the case for the 100 officers. I didn't get 100 officers, but I got 56. And the 56 was the first time that the police bureau had actually seen an increase in funding for new police officers in a long, long time. And I want you to understand the, the, the level of officers that we have today, this did not happen suddenly. This happened over many, many years that we systematically defunded the Portland Police Bureau and the personnel to the point where we now find that on a per capita basis, the number of officers that we have in our community is too low, at least relative to what other communities around the country have. And that's something I have made a priority to rectify. So we got that funding, but here's the deal. It's not like putting gas in the gas tank and stepping on the accelerator. Once you fund a new police officer, it takes about 18 months to get that police officer on the street. You have to recruit, then they go through a certification process, then they go through a training process, and then they go through a probationary process. So it takes a little time to actually see that improvement. So I fought hard for that. The gun violence reduction team that you just heard about um, I am a strong proponent of the GBRT. I think it's a very important asset in our community from a public safety perspective. There were some who wanted to eliminate the GBRT, and I had to work hard with this chief and the GBRT leadership to convince the rest of my colleagues that we should, in fact, continue to support and fund GBRT. And there's other things that we've done around data. Uh, there were some. Uh, issues around how we address the increasing issue and problem of homelessness in our community. So we brought in a homelessness liaison. We needed more information and data because the community had asked for it. So we brought in more people who can elect, help us collect good information and data about what the police bureau are doing. Um, but the bottom line from my perspective is it is very important to ensure that we fund the police bureau and that we give them the tools, the resources, and the training that they need to be successful in their jobs. That's been my position, and that will continue to be my position. Thank you for asking the question. Another question here. Ma'am? Hi, my name is Marge Crawford. Um, my thoughts about the mentally ill is that it would be very important to have a highly skilled psychologist on board. Um, there's a book called I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Health, and it's a special technique, you might have heard of it, to de-escalate people. And um, also, I think that um, working in the school system, um, changing our model of fight or flight into collaboration from middle school on up to resolve problems, is key to children and working with their families because they learn from their families, they learn from their peers. So I think we need to really work with families a lot more instead of just their children.
to help the families be successful with the child, whether they have mental illness or delinquency. There's a good reason why they're doing what they're doing. And we need to get to it and help them and partner with them to be successful. And I'm curious why I know that getting new housing, we see you know, many, many apartment buildings going up. And I have a lot of concerns about that ability to house the people we have on the streets. Is that the goal? Because I heard that we're going to get a 30% stipend to these people, which if it's 1200 that's $900, they still don't have enough money to live there. So what actually is housing happening with housing? Because we can't ask people that have diabetes, I'm sorry, you have to wait five years till we get the right facility built for you. Meanwhile, five of you will die. So I think our priority needs to be you know, a, a city is measured by what it does with the least. And we're not doing very well right now with 4,000 people on the street. Why can't we have shelters, temporary shelters built in each part of town for these people immediately? Or something for them right now, in the next six months. So, that they will be helped. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good parts there. I'll just take a quick cut at this, and then maybe somebody else would like to speak to it as well. Um, as I say, historically, the city has not been involved in social services, addiction treatment, mental health, uh, domestic violence, and the like. But we have to rethink that paradigm in our community. We have to rethink the way government works because um, the reality is people assume that in the city, the mayor and the city council by extension are addressing these issues. And for a long time, I think what happened is people just said, look, uh, it's not my problem, it's the counties or it's the states or it's the federal government. We are now taking ownership, we are putting leadership into place, and we are putting funding and programming into place to address these issues. Let me give you a couple of examples. With regard to housing, we passed the inclusionary housing ordinance in the city of Portland. That means any time you see one of these new condo, buildings going up, anytime you see a multi-family unit building going up, uh, there is a reservation of a certain number of units in those buildings for people who have lower incomes. Because we believe people who work in this community deserve to live in this community. And frankly, we don't want to become a community that's just sort of a Disneyland for rich people. We need people who, who do service work. We need people who are our firefighters and our teachers. We need people who are our police officers. We need people who are artists in our community. We need people to support our amazing, incredible food industry, culinary uh, culture in our community, and on and on and on. And so that's been a priority. Uh, this community has now passed two affordable housing bonds. The first housing bond that was issued by the city, my housing bureau is responsible for implementing it. And I'm really happy to report to people that we have already reached the full commitment. We have achieved the promises that that housing bond promised to the voters, and we've done it ahead of schedule, and we actually have resources left over that will allow us to actually exceed the original goals of that housing bond. So I'm really proud of that. And the Portland Housing Bureau, and I happen to be the commissioner of the Housing Bureau, the last two years in a row, those have been record years in terms of production of lower income housing. Now the final thing we're doing, we're actually talking about this at City Council tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, tomorrow afternoon, uh, is Better Housing by Design, which is part of our overall home, uh, housing opportunity initiative. This is going to help us to create more kinds of housing and more affordable types of housing in our community. Garden units, duplexes, triplexes and the like in areas where it's appropriate to do that. So I, I don't see there as being any one solution, but there's a lot of solutions. And then with regard to people that you mentioned on the street, uh, we just passed recently our chronic homeless plan. Uh, you are correct. You know, what's implied in your comment is there are people who are living on the street where even if you had a place to house them, they would not be successful in that housing without some additional kind of support, whether it's mental health addiction, uh, whatever kind of additional services they need, they won't be successful without it. So the best practice nationally, what we know works, is what's called supportive housing. 
So it's housing for low-income people combined with support services to help them stay in that housing and be successful in that housing. We have committed to 2,000 new units of that permanent supportive housing, and we had planned to do that over a 10-year period. We're already 650 units in, and we're a year in. So we're making good on that promise, too. I don't know if anybody else has it. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, for being here tonight. Um, I'm an eight-year-old veteran of the East Side. I was born and raised here. And I tell myself, what's happened to this lovely East Side of Portland? Just look across the street and you can see what's happening with the homeless on the freeway. We have property uh, next to Chuck E. Cheese and McDonald's, and about two and a half acres. <clears throat> and uh, over the past year, we get complaints from the neighbors. We try to keep things uh, debris and whatever they leave. And I mean, do we have to do that in the city of Portland? Can't the city come and pick these things up? And the other thing is, we have Chuck E. Cheese next door, a fun place for young kids. They're going to have to put a fence around the parking lot because of the homeless and the garbage that they continue to leave. And why do we have to do that? Well, why do we have to, why do, we have to do that in, in a, a clean, nice city like we have in Portland? And the other thing is, it's just like these shopping carts that the homeless have. Aren't they property of the businesses in Portland? Why do you allow that to uh, uh, let them have the shopping carts? And anyway, those are a few questions I have. And uh, thank you for listening to me. And uh, thank you very much. So uh, as, as somebody who was born and raised in this community, I will tell you that while it may not be the most important issue, one of the things that really breaks my heart the most is just seeing the trash, the litter, all over the place. Again, I understand it's not life or death. There are, there, there are other true life and death issues in this community, but it, it says something about the state of society. You know, you, you've been here long enough, you remember the old days where if somebody threw a coffee cup or something on the ground, you know, a, a little truck would come by and people in white hazmat suits would jump out and pick it up, right? I mean, it just didn't happen. You know, it, we, we were known as one of the most livable cities in the world, justifiably. And now, you know, if you drive in from the airport down I-84, um, to be honest, it's an embarrassment. And so I have taken it upon my administration and made it our responsibility to address things like litter cleanup. We've partnered with organizations like SALT, some of you may have volunteered with SALT, and we've created the Keep It Pretty Rose City initiative, where in every single neighborhood, including Lentz, we now have volunteer pickup days where people go out. It's a sharing experience, and it's also an opportunity to reclaim the values of our community. We also have increased actual trash and litter collection throughout the city, and I can't speak to those exact locations that you mentioned, uh, but we have significantly increased that. Uh, in the downtown area, the business community contributed to a bunch of new trash receptacles. The good news there is those trash receptacles uh, were then able to be expanded throughout the city, and we've committed to 2,000 new receptacles and the cleanup to make that happen. You mentioned specifically homeless camps. We're now going to homeless camps and we're providing garbage bags and our folks go by a few days later to collect those garbage bags and that's helped in certain areas and certain circumstances. With regard to some of the major right-of-ways, particularly uh, ODOT right-of-ways, we've been in partnership with ODOT to address the livability issues in those public right-of-ways. And uh, as I mentioned before, if, if you're talking about established homeless camps, if those camps are creating a public safety, a public health, or an environmental hazard, we post those camps, 
We send social service providers into those camps to try to find alternative and safe arrangements for the individuals who are in those camps. And then when we go back to actually remediate the camp, if belongings are left, we tag them and we bag them and we save them for the people uh, whose property it is and we clean the camp. Um, the only way we're going to stop this problem is to stop talking just about the manifestation of the problem, which is people living on the streets, people dying on the streets, and some of the associated problems of livability. The way we solve the problem is go upstream and address what got them onto the streets in the first place. For some people, it's economics. They've been priced out of their housing. For others, it's more serious issues. Um, we don't really have a very good safety net in this community or in this state for people with serious mental health issues. We've deinstitutionalized mental health at the state level several decades ago, but we didn't replace it with anything at the local level, and we still have it. And we also know that nationally, especially up and down the I-5 corridor, we have an addiction crisis. It's meth, it's heroin, it's opioids, and uh, as I said right in my introduction, um, we're you know, third or fourth in the nation in terms of addiction rates per capita and about 47 in terms of access to treatment. Until we address those issues head on and fund it and support the solutions, we're going to continue to have to deal with the manifestations of the homeless crisis. I'm determined that we will continue to work hard to provide the services we need to get people off the streets and keep them off the streets. And because it isn't just Portland, we're working with other cities all up and down the West Coast to collectively address this crisis. It's a really important issue. And I thank you for your forbearance and your patience. And I hear what you're saying, because I share your view. Hi, my name is Sarah Wines. I'm the Vice Chair of the Lindsay Association. And I'd like to thank all the community members for coming and together. together. Um, you guys really bond together and make a really awesome community. And that's why I love living in Lux. Um, I'm a single parent. I just became a single parent due to personal horrible issues in my marriage. And I'm a single parent in my 20s. I'm a 20 year old son. Six days ago, I became homeless. Last night, I was going to sleep in my car with some friends. Go through, maybe a room. And I'm a capable woman. I'm college educated. I can network. I have resources. I have friends. I'm smart. I can't imagine what it's like to live on the streets and not have those skills and try to get out of what they're doing. Because I call places, I call churches, I call 211. I was told to go to Washington County and register for their pilot program to sleep in my car with my six year old. Sleep in my car with my six year old. In November, I was appalled. I called every place looking for a shelter bed. There was nothing available. I want to know what I can do to help my community and help the situation because I know I'll go through through this. I I look. I'm a strong person. I'm smart, and all the great people here that I depended on and have depended on me. And I want to know what we're going to do to fix this. And it scares me. And my six year old's in the room over there, and I shelter her from what's happening. I mean, she's gone through domestic violence, and her dad being addicted to drugs and alcohol, and it's been hard for her, and it's been hard for me. But I have to shelter her. Her safety comes first. My safety, her safety, my health, her health, my happiness, her happiness. But I've learned about the people out there that are capable, who don't have college education, who can't network, who can't communicate. How are they going to get through this? Yeah, I, I did I didn't just want to briefly respond. First of all, I want to thank you for, for telling us your story. Uh, and I want to thank you for your resilience and your courage. Um, and I want to make sure that before you leave tonight, you've connected with a member of my team so that we can get you off the streets and out of your car. Um, that's the first thing. Your second question is a really hard question to answer which is how do people who don't have some of the resilience or the strength or the resources or the connections that you have, how do they get help? 
And the answer is for too many of them, they do not. And they're still out there. And a lot of them die on our streets. And I think, you know, regardless of what we feel about different strategies, I think we all acknowledge in this room that that is unacceptable. Somebody else said it earlier, we will be judged by how we treat the least amongst us. That is an old saying, and it holds true. We are defined by how we treat the most vulnerable in our community. And right now, we are not being very successful. Now, I'm proud of the work that Multnomah County has done around the family shelter system. You know, weirdly enough, I actually got into politics because I volunteered for many years at the Goose Hollow Family Shelter, which was uh, an emergency homeless shelter for people who had children under the age of 12. And I couldn't believe that in a city as prosperous as Portland, that this problem was as widespread as it was, and it still is. If anything, it's gotten worse. We've certainly opened more shelters and more services for women and children. But if you look at the data from Portland Public Schools about the number of students who are homeless, living in cars or couch surfing, or even living outdoors, uh, it is unacceptable. And so um, one way that everybody can help personally is work with us when we try to open new shelters in your neighborhood, advocate for it. Push back against those who say, no, we don't want a shelter. When we try to create low housing, low cost housing, low, low income housing in your neighborhood, work with us and advocate and work with your neighbors to address their concerns or their anxieties about having that housing located in their neighborhood. When we try to provide services, predominantly through the county, but when we try to provide services that could help get the chronically homeless off the streets, like for example trying to place a methadone clinic or a needle exchange program, help people to understand that these things are important steps in getting people off the streets and into housing and into a position where they can reconnect with their lives because we've seen it done. I've seen so many people in this community who have moved from chronic homelessness back to very happy, fulfilling, and full lives. It can be done. And frankly, I don't think we tell the stories enough. And so you being here today, sharing your story about where you are, um, I look forward to the next time I see you and you can tell the story about where you are now, which I hope is in a warm, dry, safe, and adequate housing situation for you and your son. And I, I want to make sure... Yep, so um, let's let's get you hooked up. Um, who, who, who from my team is ah, in the back? Can you make sure you connect before the end of the evening? Thank you.
some of the homeless out there don't even want to get off of the street. Some of them are comfortable where they're at. I don't know that percentage. I don't know if you guys have actually engaged with a homeless person, but I took it upon myself to go ask about 30 homeless people, what brought you here to the street? Why did you choose to do this? Um, some were, you know, actually from prominent families that own a lot of properties here in the state of Oregon. And they're just like, well, they said they were going to let me stay on the couch, but I didn't do what I was supposed to do to achieve what I needed to do. So now I'm living here on the street, and now I have health problems. So then it just surprises me how we're not engaged with each other. And I think social change and us actually engaging with each other would be very helpful. Besides just asking you, you know, Ted, and to our police officers, help us, help us, help us. But what you could do, and what I got from, um, when I went through a DV situation from um, DA Sook, was like, hey, this is how you could be, like, this is a way you could change your life. And I don't see Officer Brown here tonight. He used to be a Southeast Precinct uh, officer. I want to say thank you to him, because he saved me from gun violence. I could have been dead, but, you know, everybody comes into your life for certain reasons, and I just want people just to understand and stop hitting against each other, and let's all work with each other, including our police officers, or if we don't feel comfortable with the cops, let's work with each other to get these guns, get these drugs, and get everybody just engaged and help each other out. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, could, could we get just a, a real quick question, maybe 30 seconds a minute, and then pass it around two or three people? Yeah, okay. In the back. In the back, in the back. Show me a hand in the back. Victoria? Or whatever's happening, 
They go into the neighborhood, hold us hostage, and victimize us, and they steal and do everything else to support their habit and to make our life miserable, a living hell. No, I just wanted to acknowledge your comment. Thank you very much for saying that because I think there's a there's a perception that either and I know this isn't what you're saying that we turn the blind eye and that is not by any means the case. Uh, I want to point out, and a lot of you know this, that we are but one part of the criminal justice system. And I've said this before, we can come, we can make arrests, we can come and make citations, but it doesn't abate the problem. We cite them, they're still there. We make an arrest, they may be released, um, or there may or may not be um, jail space, right? And they may not even get the services that, that they need. I appreciate hearing the support behind that comment because publicly, we are often criticized about over-policing uh, the homeless population. And then I, we also get criticized for not doing enough. And I think it's important to stress that there can be a balance, but there is also a need to maintain order around these things because they lend to livability issues that we're talking about and discussing here. So I want to acknowledge that, and I think this is the first step because there are other people in the room that also realize that we're not solely the answer to this, but there are communities that expect something to be done. So I just wanted to publicly thank you for saying that. If, if I could just piggyback on the comment as well, because um, your, your, your concern was, it's well founded and it's well stated, and I actually hear that a lot. People say, well, I, I hear you say you're going to provide treatment, I hear you say you're going to work hard on mental health services, I hear you say you're going to provide affordable housing, I hear you say you're going to provide job training. Well, what about me? What about my family? And what about our safety? And what about the livability in our community? What about access to our parks? And what about people who are uh, you know, littering or uh, doing drugs or leaving needles in places where our kids can see them or find them or step on them? And I want you to understand this if you understand anything about the approach that I'm trying to lead here in the community and that it is a comprehensive approach because all of these things are true. On one hand, we need a compassionate approach to the crisis that has been in the making for years, which has led to homelessness. And it's a crisis that has been led by growth, by a lack of housing infrastructure, by economic changes in our economy where people at the bottom are increasingly finding themselves farther and farther behind the curve in terms of being able to afford to put a decent roof over their head. We are now experiencing a crisis around addiction because our nation and our state and our community were late to acknowledge and own and address that addiction crisis. We still have not addressed the mental health crisis in our community, nor have we made the investments, put the infrastructure in place, or even develop a plan for having comprehensive, on-demand mental health treatment in our community. And on top of that, we have a policing crisis, I'll call it a public safety crisis, because over a period of many, many years, we defunded policing in our community. And now we find ourselves behind the curve. So uh, we need both a compassionate response to homelessness, we need to provide the services that will get people off the street and keep them off the street, and yes, they are expensive, but that's what it takes to get people off the street. But that does not mean we will abandon our community principles, our community standards, or forego enforcement of the law. We will do those things too. So it is a combination of compassion, of resources, and accountability. And you will find that across the front, we've made investments in all of those areas. Treatment, mental health, prevention programs, housing programs, public safety programs, including the police officer programs we've talked about, the foot patrols we put into place, the new rangers that we put into the parks to be able to accommodate some of the concerns people have about safety, the new livability programs we put into place, trash, needle collection, biohazards, the new hygiene stations that we just funded in the last budget process, 
Uh, we have to do all of the above because homelessness is really not one condition. It is a manifestation of years of neglect in many different areas as well as social changes that have converged into this perfect storm to create this West Coast homeless crisis that we're currently confronting. Sometimes it seems overwhelming, but I'll tell you, when you break it down into these different parts, all of a sudden you start to see in every one of these areas, we can make progress and there are specific programs that we can put into place and strategies that we can implement and specific target investments that we can make that will begin to show results. And that's what we're going to do. It's not going to happen quickly, and it's not going to be cheap, but it's what we need to do. It is the dog work of doing what we need to do to address what is obviously the largest social crisis facing in our society, which is this humanitarian crisis of homelessness. But we as a community, we are big enough and we are good enough to solve it, and we will. Mr. Mayor, uh, Chief Outlaw, thank you for your addressing this lady's concerns. And I really appreciate, Mr. Mayor, that you're an eloquent speaker. And I'm hearing a lot of rhetoric that sounds like campaign. And I came up here today to express the same as she did that these programs, although they sound really nice, and they're probably the right way to go, they aren't working yet. I still have motorhomes on my street. I still have bags full of garbage and needles. I still hear gunshots every night from my house. And what I came here to tell you that, it all sounds really pretty. Come walk down my street with me. Come walk down my street. You guys, you guys, come walk through our neighborhood. Come hear what we hear. Come see what we see. Walk by the drug houses. I mean, yes, we have a homeless problem, and yes, it's a mental health and it's a drug problem. But all this flowery language isn't getting us anywhere. We need more action. We need efficiency in our bureaus to get this work actually done. I pay. I want to see work done. I'm a builder. I build homes. And I work all over this city. And I see the way other communities are treated. And then I come home to Lance. Let me just quickly res respond to the gentleman because um, I agree with you. Uh, the problem hasn't been solved. It hasn't even. You, you know, I went almost three years into my first term as mayor, and I acknowledge everything you said, and I want to be very clear, uh, I am not denying that there is a homeless crisis in their, this community, there clearly is. I'm simply stating to the best of my ability what I think, you know, how you pull the problem apart and how you solve it. And what I'm seeing, and if you have a different perspective, let me know. I'm seeing a housing affordability crisis. The cost of housing in Portland has gone up dramatically faster than household income in this community. And that means we need to pursue strategies to create more supply of lower income housing. And I talked about some of the ways we're doing it. So that's one piece. Then you've got the other piece, which is we have a mental health crisis. I assume you agree? I, I do agree. And therefore, we need to pursue strategies that actually create more on-demand mental health treatment and services. If people won't come to us, then we will go to them. And that's what the navigation teams that we funded in this last year's budget are doing. And that's what the street response will do, uh, the Commissioner Hardesty and I are working on. Then there's the addiction piece. Do you agree that we have an addiction problem in this community? Because I, I feel like we have a horrific addiction problem. And therefore, even though the city has historically never been involved in this area, we are now actually putting dollars behind programming to begin to address that issue. And yes, I will be holding others accountable in this community and around the state for doing something more aggressive around addiction services in this community. It's very important. Then there's other people, the, the uh, young woman who stood up a few minutes ago, um, you know, 
her circumstances may be different, or other people, maybe they just lost their job and they can't afford the rent and they're out. Um, you know, that requires different strategies. So this isn't intended to be in any way obfuscatory. I'm, I'm just saying this is how I break this complex problem apart in those component parts, and that's how I think we need to address the issues. Understand, it's a multifaceted issue. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It's going to have to be a lot of different solutions, and it's going to require different people to participate, not just government. The hospitals are going to have to participate. Social service providers are going to have to participate. Community organizations that work in the areas of livability and safety and health are going to have to participate. And I just sort of see my job as being the convener and the person who brings these different institutions and people together to help make it happen. I believe you if I may, entire... If I may make a suggestion. Yes, yes sir. Stop talking, start working. Okay, we've got about 25 minutes left, and in an effort to get as many people an opportunity to make a comment or ask a question, um, if you can keep it at uh, 30 seconds, say a minute. give away an apartment building or a condominium. They were buying it. And I noticed that, and a lot of other people who watch market trends noticed it too. Why were they buying? They were buying because the federal government artificially lowered interest rates so money was free, and the housing market had collapsed, 
So the cost of the housing was low. And so I and many others started saying, my God, we should be out there buying up affordable housing left and right, and we should be buying land left and right. Because someday, the value will go up. Um, you know, those private equity firms that you mentioned, they are opportunistic. Government should be opportunistic too, in that same regard. Some of you may remember I actually uh, proposed and it went to the ballot in this state that we use a mechanism to create a permanent fund for higher education and job training. I proposed a $500 million fund using state bonds that at the time went for about 1%. At the time the stock market had crashed, uh, had we done that, we would have had about $100, $150 million in that fund today, but we didn't do it because government's not opportunistic enough. Um, so that's my answer to that. But what are we doing today? Uh, number one, the inclusionary housing policy is passed. So that makes sure that even as private sector housing is built at market, there is still affordable housing in those units. You passed, excuse me, you passed collectively uh, a Portland housing bond, which includes very low income housing, down to 30% MFI, and it was my job and is my job to deliver on the promises of that bond. And as I've said, we are ahead of schedule and we are going to deliver more housing than was promised in that bond. So at every opportunity, I'm using whatever skills I have and whatever skills we've got in our housing bureau in our city to do whatever we can to create more housing particularly lower income housing. But the reality is at 30% MFI, it has to be subsidized. And that's what we're doing. Because a lot of people don't know about that. You have to share that knowledge so people can do that too. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, my name is Tom Borden. I'm, uh, uh, I live with my family in the uh, cul-de-sac at Southeast Steel and multi-use town. Um, and I have a question about gun violence. Um, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the work that the city and the law enforcement have done, at least in our cul-de-sac, since the last um, town hall meeting that the mayor and the city council came out two months, I guess, a little over a year ago. Because um, the situation has improved a lot in our, in our specific zone, which was ODOT managed, now the city's managed, and then the homeless camp um, situation has gotten better, so I do appreciate that because the footbridge, my daughters go to Lent Elementary School right across the footbridge um, at, at the end of our cul-de-sac. There's hundreds of kids that walk across that footbridge every day to go to school, and um, at least our general neighborhood has been designated as a special site, and I do appreciate that. Since that livability meeting last year, gun violence in our cul-de-sac and in our general area has definitely increased. So my question is, um, you know, and I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. We hear gunshots a lot. Um, there's frustration in our cul-de-sac. People call the, the police, people call 911. Sometimes the response is very slow. Sometimes there's no response at all. Um, my question is, what is the city, what is law enforcement, what's the police department and GBRT specifically doing in sites and areas where there's either a lot of gun violence that you're noticing, or whether it's a specific site that's right near a school, it's not just our school, the school's all over Lance, you know, where kids are in are you know are in are in danger of getting caught in this, because this is happening not just during the daytime, not just during the night, daytime too. Um, so my question is is about that. So that's Ms. Hawk. So it's a very detailed question. So we work with partnerships. Again, once you call 911, that means the incident already occurred. So we use data, we look at calls driven, and a lot of folks, you think call 911, they don't. You think somebody else will be calling 911. So a lot of times we think, well, my neighbor must be hurt, they'll call 911. Uh, so GBRC responds after the fact, and we look at data by 911 calls and incidents, and we work with the group over there, I can't speak highly enough of the Office of Youth Violence Prevention, uh, they'll go out into the neighborhoods and work with community members there. Uh, they identify you know, youth in the area or you know, other individuals that associate that type of lifestyle. They'll work with them to prevent that violence from occurring. And we look at the data and we'll deploy our folks to help the uniform patrol 
to do act more active patrol in the area to find out what is the root problem of the shootings. Uh, for example, one area in the Lansing neighborhood is a house being uh, victimized by gunfire on a number of occasions. Uh, people residing there don't want to cooperate with the police. Uh, we'll send out our outreach team to work with the family, see if we can help them move, see if we can get them resources to prevent this violence from occurring. So a lot of these are really, it's a police issue, but we try to use other avenues to prevent the shootings. So uh, find me after, and I'd love to talk more. Okay, before we go on, um, Tom, can you say a word from Office of Youth Violence Prevention um, just around that question and some of the work that OPE is doing? The Office of Youth Violence Prevention is a, uh, provides grant funding to uh, non-governmental agencies that offer culturally specific services to um, people that are at risk, uh, trauma involved, uh, uh, could be gunfire, could be other trauma-inducing activity. Uh, we have a number of street level gang outreach workers that are here tonight with us that are uh, funded through the city but are uh, employed by Portland Opportunities Industrialization Center, Latino Network, uh, immigrant and refugee uh, community organization. Um, and so they're here tonight uh, listening to you and trying to get a feel for what's needed in this community. So what I would suggest is did you take the opportunity, and uh, can I have the outreach team please stand up that are sitting down? I know I have some up against the wall. Please uh, stand up so we can see who you are. If you have any questions about services that are available to the street mobile gang outreach team, uh, they're here tonight. And we also have our gang impacted family team coordinator who actually works as a hub between the police bureau and all services that are connected to the county and the city to be able to route requests through our office to be able to uh, deal with uh, housing uh, relocation, uh, uh, referral services that are needed by families, youth, and people that are experiencing trauma. Uh, Tracy Aliot, can you raise your hand? And, uh, she is our gang impact the family team coordinator, so please see her. There's information on that back table uh, right directly back, somebody's got their hand up back there. Uh, the information on what is provided through the Office of Youth Violence Prevention, it's actually the Mayor's Office of Youth Violence Prevention. So thank you very much. And Tom, we have an announcement to make around our new director, Boss. Do you want to introduce our new director who's here with us this evening? Would you like to do it, Tom, or just say a word about it? Go ahead, Tom. Is, is Nike? Yeah, she's here. <laughs> oh, Nike, where are you? Nike. Nike Green. Uh, Nike Green is, uh, has been uh, selected as our new director. Nike, can you please stand up? Please? I could not see you. So. Uh, Services. Yet we have 
a crime-ridden property. We spend a third of our operating budget on security, yet crime continues to rise. We spend another third on that, uh, of our budget, on the maintenance of the property, yet the needles, the machetes, the, the, uh, the drugs, the prostitutes, they continue to come to the property, they continue to uh, be a blight on the experience of the property, and when we pass those costs on to the tenants, what happens? The businesses become unsustainable. So because of the situation, we have put an entire economic engine in the middle of the Lentz neighborhood at risk. When we call the police, it's nearly impossible for them to do everything they need to do. While we love them, it's nearly impossible. We have, we have people with machetes on the property, and the, because of overcrowding, because of other situations, the only thing they can do is take the machete away and send the person along. They may get arrested, an hour later they're back on the property. We have homeless camps around. The, we, we trespass, and we have over a thousand people in our trespass book. And here's the thing that really pains me. We have people that work hard every day to clean up the property, to maintain it. These people live in this community. They work hard to pay a mortgage, to, to support the community. They get stuck by needles. They're put at risk every day. Our security officers are assaulted. And what we hear, we love. Progress. Things are in the works. We're a business. We don't have the luxury of time. We don't have the luxury to wait. What, what, do, you, what do we say to the, to the employee? We've had two employees this year stuck by needles, just cleaning up. What about the dignity of those folks? I hear compassion. I saw the report, the documentary, where you said you were concerned about the, the, the uh, sustainability of compassion. We're compassionate. We love people, but you know, we love the employees too. And they can't be stuck by needles, they can't be assaulted. They can't. So what's the, I guess the question is, what are the results? Where, when's the, when do we start seeing the results? She's saying, like, it, it's better than a tent. Is that what you're talking about, ma'am? Well, we... inclusionary housing policy, etc. And your question is, do those things actually inhibit the creation 
of affordable housing. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would respectfully argue that that is not the case. I would respectfully argue that the data shows that in fact there is plenty of housing being created. The problem right now is that the housing that is being created isn't, a, the, we're under supply. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why don't you come up so he can hear here. you. Come up here. Uh, we, I'll, I'll just say this. We, we tr listen. We, we try to balance health, safety, protections for people who are renters in particular, with also the supply side issues that developers and housing advocates and others ask us for. For example, we've reformed the permitting system. When, when I came here two years ago, uh, I remember somebody in this audience saying that the permitting process was onerous. It was very hard to permit housing in the city. So we completely reformed the permitting process. We elected, put in the Portland online permitting system. Uh, we streamlined that process. The fire folks who are here know that there's one life safety piece of the permitting process that used to take eight weeks that we've now cut down to one week. So there's supply side things we're doing too. It's a balance. Well, that, those, those, you know, there, there's been various rules that have been passed by the city council, uh, one of which said that you could only raise rent, I think it was 9.99% per year. Uh, and when we went out and we surveyed landlords, we found that most people weren't raising the rent 10% per year. Uh, if you are raising the rent 10% per year, uh, that's way ahead of the market increase in terms of costs. We've got time for about one more question, and then I know that the Neighborhood Association would like to wrap up. My name is Susie Hall. I own a small business in Lens Park here for 37 years. It's getting harder and harder to run a business here. The government treats those people so well, and then they think that they can come in the store, they took whatever they want, since we own it. Why can city walk out the program, say, teach them how to walk. So we have we have a walk fair instead of welfare. Yeah. I see people yeah. I see people about 37 years in the school from beginning they use EBT. 30 years later they still use EBT. Now the kids use it. Great kids use it. If we have a program to teach them how to work, how to respect the job, instead of sit at home, wait for welfare. We well, have to pay for all those. Okay, you know, and then the more, more program you're going to put up with them. Can I ask you, who's going to pay for it? Is she going to pay? Or should we, as the business owner, pay for it? I understand about the ladies park have problem. We, my employee, have a deal with the people every single day. We have, we will try to clean up the garbage can, stuck in there, the needles in there. I am employing her like this. How can you help and protect the people who are at work instead of people on the street? That's my question. So uh, the answer is we should be doing again all of the above. It's not an either or. We need to respect your rights as a business owner and operator. I want you to be successful. I don't want your employees to have to be exposed to all kinds of environmental risks. And believe me, you're not alone. I hear about this a lot from a lot of different people. And again, um, I understand your frustration and I understand your anger. I didn't come here expecting 
anything other than that because people have a right to be angry. They have a right to be frustrated. They have a right to be anxious about this crisis. And I'm going to confess something. I am too. And so I am doing what I think are the right strategies to basically undo years of neglect or misdiagnosing the problem or failing to make the right investments to be able to address these issues. And um, I understand that you know, the, the gentleman over here basically used my punchline. Uh, it doesn't matter what information we give. It doesn't matter what data give. When people open their door and they look out and they see the problem until they stop seeing the problem, it's not solved. And we're a long way from that. So I guess what I would say to you, um, and I'm asking you for too much, I think. Um, you don't really know me yet. I haven't been around long enough for you to see the real results that you want to see. But if you think the strategies that we are pursuing around housing, around prevention, around shelter, around treatment, mental health services, around job training, around supportive housing, if you think those are not the right strategies, uh, in addition to livability and the public safety, um, I am very open-minded to hearing new and different and better ideas. And people have given us new and different and better ideas. The hygiene pilot, which we funded in the last budget, uh, I didn't make that up. That came to me from the community. Somebody had a really good idea. They connected us with other people who knew how to do this kind of thing. They showed us some jurisdictions that had already done it. And we said, hey, that works. It looks great. Let's do it here. Uh, you know, that's just one example of where somebody brought an innovation to us, an idea to us, and it worked really well. If you have others, I'm very interested in hearing. I, you know, I, I'd love to work with you on it. We're just at time. What, here's what I want everybody in the room to know. We wanted to be here tonight to hear from you, specifically what your concerns were. We, well, are, my, my we concern hold, hold on, let me, let me finish with the wrap up. My concern is I want people leaving here knowing that on this larger stage and on a larger scale, there's many resources committed, there are many programs being enacted, but we clearly hear the concerns that are raised by people who are living in the neighborhoods or who are conducting business or who are facing challenges or threats to health or safety. Don't leave here tonight. Get, get my card, get other representatives' cards. We had the Montebello Neighborhood Association meeting about two or three weeks ago, and out of that, we have been following up with questions and concerns that have been raised. Some of you have very specific things you haven't been able to ask, or you want, or you need done. So we want to do both. We want to provide strategically on a larger scale for the concerns you have about your neighborhood, your businesses, and your community. But we also want to help you with the assistance of the district attorney, with the uh, Bureau of Transportation, with Johnny back in the back from one point of contact, with Civic Life, with 911, with all of the folks that are here to support you. I hope you, I hope you leave here tonight knowing you have been heard, but we're, it's not enough. We want to follow up and follow through with you specifically, in addition to all the encouragement and all the things you heard tonight about things that are being done on your behalf. So with that, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight, and let's uh, do a round of applause for everybody. Thank you.